you have a Bible or uh, you have it on your phone, uh, turn to Psalm, the book of Psalms. Um, most of you, if you've been here all summer long, you know that's not a surprise to you because we're doing a series in the book of Psalms. As if, if this is your first Sunday or, or maybe you're back, uh, you haven't been maybe because of school and you've just been busy. But anyway, we're doing a series called Summer in the Psalms and we're looking through different chapters uh, in the book of Psalms and, and what God has to say to us through these through these chapters, and um, you see a lot of real life happening in the book of Psalms. A lot of joy, a lot of celebration, a lot of surrender, but a lot of, a lot of sadness, a lot of despair, a lot of struggle. But ultimately, it, it all points us to the fact that God is God and He is in control. And so that's where we are. We are, we are in Psalm, and we're going to be in Psalm chapter 1. Um, just if you want to start reading ahead for next week, next week um, I'll be speaking again, and next week we're going to be in Psalm 23. A lot of you know Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. It's probably one of the most famous or most familiar passages in all of Scripture. You could probably walk into a grocery store and and just say, hey, the Lord is my shepherd, and someone will shout back, I shall not want. It's just familiar. You hear it a lot of different places. We're going to be looking at that next week, uh, so you can begin reading that, praying praying through that, um, and hopefully we can have a sort of a a fresh look at Psalm 23. But for today, we're in Psalm 1, and I'm going to read... um, the whole chapter, it's all six verses long. So here we go. It says, so uh, my, my Bible has the little heading, the two ways. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked, this is verse 4, the wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. And verse 6, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Um, when I first started in ministry, uh, surrendered my life to ministry uh, full time when I was uh, just graduated high school and I was 18 years old and I got right into youth ministry. I was in youth ministry for, for 18 years of, of, my, of my ministry life and, and I love students. I love student ministry. I still feel called to student ministry. I think it's probably one of the most important ministries we have here in our church. But uh, I was 18 and I was serving as a youth intern, just graduated high school, was serving as a youth intern in the youth group that I grew up in, in my church that I grew up in, Pioneer Drive Baptist Church uh, there in Abilene, Texas. And I just started Hardin Simmons University. Um, and this was uh, back in 1991. Uh, some of you remember way back in 1991. It was a, that, was a, <laughs> that, was a, that was a hard time to be alive. If you remember 1990, and just, just so you know, it was a tough time because in 1991, we had less than 100 TV stations to choose from in 1991. Um, you couldn't, here's, here's another thing. In 1991, you couldn't do anything on a cell phone or in a phone except call someone. And who wants to call someone? You couldn't, you couldn't do anything but just call someone on a phone. Uh, here was, here was a, a brutal thing. In, in movie theaters in 1991, there were no recliners. Uh, I mean, you just had to sit up and watch a movie. It was, it was brutal. Um, the only food I think that you could get delivered to your home in 1991 was pizza. It's all that would come to your home. Um, the, there was only, in Abilene at that time, there was only one Chick-fil-A. And it wasn't even a freestanding one. It was in the mall. So you had to go to the mall to get the, the greatest chicken there, that there ever was. And, and, and so uh, that, was, that was really super inconvenient. Oh, here's the other thing. Well, we didn't have these in Abilene. But like I remember coming to the big city here in Dallas sometimes. And, and you drive on a toll road. And, and back in 1991, you actually had to stop at a toll booth and get out this thing. It's, I think it's money. It's in, in, in change. And you had to throw it at the machine and then hope that the, that the post would come up so you could go through. It was, I mean, it was just a brutal time to be alive. But fortunately, I survived and I made it. But anyway, 1991, and I remember giving my first, uh, I don't know if you would call it a sermon because I was, eight, I was 18 and I, I don't know that it was that good. You'd have to ask the kids that were there back then. Um, it, more of a Bible study. And it was, it was to a group of middle school students in Abilene at that time. Middle school was 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Um, and it was about riding the fence. Any of you know what riding the fence means? 
kind of that term. Yeah, it's, it's basically a term that means uh, you're, you're non-committal. You won't, you won't choose a side. You're just kind of, you're just kind of trying, to, trying to play down the middle or, or, or staying on top of the fence, riding the fence. And the point in, 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 in Bible study, in Christian terms, riding the fence means that you were trying to live for yourself and be all about yourself, but also trying to be all about God too, and you were trying to balance the two. And, and the whole point of the lesson, I, I remember, was that you, you can't do both. Riding the fence was not an option. And, and that's exactly today in Psalm 1, that's, that's what the author of, of this psalm is, is trying to tell us. He's, he's looking at you and me, and he's telling us that we have two choices, okay? Not three, three, not four, um, but we have, we have two. You can choose A, choose A, or you can choose B, but that's it. You can't ask for another choice. You can't make up your own choice. Like we, I think we made up right in the fence. That's, that's not something you can make up. And, and here are your two choices, and this is in the outline if you want to take notes, okay? And, and for our purpose today, A is if you choose A, then you're choosing, you can be a follower of God. You're choosing to follow God. Now, if you choose B, you guys can probably already know, know where this is going, you can be a follower of culture. Now, when I say culture, I, I'm just basically talking about anything, following anything or anyone other than God. That's it. And those are your two choices. Follow God, follow culture. There's not a third one, not a fourth one. There's no in between. It's one or the it's one or the ultimate the other. And you know what the ultimate difference is between the two? Following God, following culture. It boils down to this. What is the ultimate authority in your life? What's the ultimate authority in your life? Is it God or is it the world? Is it culture? Um, what determines right or wrong in your life? Is it God or, or is it what culture says? Um, what, what determines, um, w- w- or when you wake up every morning, who, who's in charge of you? Is it, is it going to be God or, or is it going to be culture? And I'm so glad that there's only two choices. I don't do really well with a lot of choices. I'm, I'm, I'm a guy, that, like, you know, when I go shopping, I, I just, I know what I want. And, and when I see it, I just go get it. I like it. And, and oftentimes when I go shopping uh, with, with my wife, she'll tell me, but what if you see something else that you like better? And that's not me. I'm just like, I'm just going to take my chances with this. Uh, and if I see something that's better, then I'm like, well, okay, maybe next time. But I just, I just go in. I know what I want. And, and you, know where, you know where I really, 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 this too many choices thing gets me? Um, have you ever gone to buy paint? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. At Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever store that you go to, I mean, this is, I, I hate, I hate painting. I hate manual labor anyway, but you know, I just, I hate painting and I hate more than painting, I hate choosing the paint color. And again, uh, my wife and I are very different. She, she likes to look at the, the millions of shades of colors that, that are there. And, and here's the thing, she, she likes to look at it in different light. Um, and, and, and she'll put it on different, and then she wants to get several colors, and then she paints them on the wall, and then we have to look at them for a month and, and see which one we really like, and then sometimes we have to go back because it's, it's just not, and, and this is, it, it, it's just crazy to me. Um, I actually went uh, on, online this week when I was thinking about talking about this, and I went to Home Depot's website, okay? And if you work at Home Depot or you own stock in Home Depot, Home Depot's great, whatever, I don't care. If you love Lowe's, this is not a knock on any of them because I'm sure it's the same thing, but I went to Home Depot's website, and I went under paint, and I wanted to choose a paint. Well, first they have those primary colors, uh, or those main colors, and so I just picked blue, because blue's my favorite color. Obviously, I'm wearing different shades of blue today. Okay, it's my favorite color. So when I picked blue, guess what popped up? When I picked blue, I had to choose between, I think it was 15 shades of blue. And then after I picked a shade of blue, guess what I had to do there? Under that particular, remember there's 15 of them, under this particular shade that I picked, there were anywhere from 50 to 60 different colors underneath that shade of blue. I had no idea there were that many blue. Did you know that there were that many blue? I thought blue was blue. And you know, and just, just so you know, um, there's blue ice age. There's Niagara Falls, there's Clear Blue Sky, there's Monaco, I didn't even know Monaco was a shade of blue. Uh, Oh, there's the Wild Blue Yonder, 
Um, there's horizon haze. Sounds like what you wake up to in the morning, a horizon haze. There's Riviera blue. There's Windjammer. Did you know Windjammer was a shade of blue? It just, that's just to name a few of the 50 or 60 that were under the, the shade, of, 15 of the shade of blue. And you know what? That just, that, all I want to do is dropkick my computer and run away when I see that. But thankfully, guess what? God made it so that we just have two. Two choices. And here's, here's the thing that I want to emphasize. It's your choice. Isn't that cool? You choose. God's not going to force you to choose. No one makes you choose. You, your, your grandparents can't make you choose. Your parents can't make you choose. Your kids can't make you choose. Your teachers can't make you choose. I can't make you choose. God, he, he's not going to make you choose. It's, it's your choice. And here's the other thing. God's going to honor whatever choice you make. Now, don't, don't understand this. God has a choice that he would love for you to make. Matter of fact, he actually died for one of these choices for you to make. Okay, he would love for you, but he's not going to do that. You see, because the, the Bible says in Revelation that he, that he stands at the door and knocks. You see, God is going to wait to be invited in. He's a gentleman. He's not going to kick down the door and come, I'm God, you know, choose me. He's going to be a gentleman. And so you get to choose. You get to decide. And, 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 there's, and there's two. So let's, I, I think we should talk about the two choices. Now, remember, I said A is if you choose to follow, you're choosing to follow God. B is you're choosing to follow culture. So let's, let's talk about A. And I, I know you looked at the, the blanks in the outline and you're like, oh my gosh, we're going to be here a while. I'm gonna, we're going to fly through these, especially these first three. We're going to fly through them fast. So if you choose A, you don't think like culture. You think differently. If you choose A, you're, you're not, you're, you don't think like the culture. You don't think like the, you're thinking differently. Romans 12, 2, this is familiar to you. If you grew up reading your Bible, you grew up in church, it says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. You see, you transform, your, you change your mind so that you will know God's will. And notice, it, it, it's, it's a renewal. It's changing. You're thinking differently. You see, because our thought life naturally just, it, it's, it's naturally drawn to ourselves. It's, it's, it's and, and away from God. But being a follower of, of God means that you're changing how you think. And, and secondly, if you choose A, you don't behave like culture. You act differently. Matthew 4, 17, it says, From that point, from that time, Jesus began to announce, change your heart and lives. Here comes the kingdom of God. Jesus is announcing it's time to change your mind and it's time to change the way that you act. You see, because when your mind starts to change, guess what follows? Your actions. Because what you believe really does affect what you do, how you act. And whatever you let in here and here, whatever you let in here, it always, it always comes out. It always comes out in your life. And thirdly, if you choose A, you don't belong to culture. So you don't, you don't think like culture, you don't act like culture, and you don't belong to culture because you're not of this world. You weren't made for this world. You were made for eternity. 1 John 4, 4 through 6. Listen to how many times he says that we belong to God. Here's one. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the Spirit who lives in you is greater than the Spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. See, so we don't think like the world, we don't act like the world, because we don't belong to this world. We don't belong to this world. Now, do you see the progression? Think, act, belong. You see, what happens is, is we, if, if we start thinking about something, okay, then, then, then we start to kind of begin to process that. And, a lot of, and when we think about it enough, then what eventually happens is, is it comes out in who we are and we start acting like it. And then and the more and more we act on something, the more and more that we believe that it's the right thing to do. And it, it, it's, it becomes truth. It kind of becomes our identity. And so that's why the, the author, he, 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 he says that, he, he in Psalm 1, he starts off with, with three big don'ts. He says, don't walk in the advice of the wicked. Don't stand in the pathway of sinners. Don't sit 
in the company of mockers. And there's your progression again. Don't walk. In other words, don't go there. Go there in your mind. Don't go there in their mind. You don't let those thoughts of the culture creep in and take root. Don't stand. And the picture uh, uh, that you get of standing is like you're, 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 you're there. You're, you're not going to move. You're not budging. And, and, and the psalmist says, don't, don't do that either. Don't get yourself stuck in the ways of culture, stuck in the way of how they value temporal things, stuck in how, how culture views God, stuck in how culture views right and wrong. Don't, don't stand there. Get, get out. So, so don't go there in your mind and don't get stuck in the ways of culture. And then it says, don't sit. And that whole, the idea of sitting means that you're, you're kind of dwelling. You're, 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 you're dropping, you're, you're making base camp there. You're, you're, you're putting down roots. And it, it, it basically is saying you, you're, a, you're a part of it. And not only are you a part of culture, if you allow this to happen, you're a part of culture, but then you begin to kind of preach the gospel of culture. Like this is how you need to live your life. This is, this is how you need to think. This is how you need to act. Start putting boundaries on people. Let people do what they want to do. You just, you do you. So we don't, we don't want to, we don't want to think that way. So we, we want to stay away. We don't want to act that way, so we don't just stand there and get stuck. And we don't, we don't want to grow roots in culture. You see, because we, we don't belong to culture. Culture doesn't define us. It's not supposed to define us. Culture sh- shouldn't get to dictate our lives. That's not the job of culture. That's not its role. If you choose A, okay, then you're going to think like Christ. You're going to have the mind of Christ. If you choose A, then you're going to act like Christ. You're going to walk in His footsteps. And if you choose A, you're going to identify yourself with Christ because you belong to Him. We are His children. So the question is, if you don't want to, you don't want to think, act, and belong to culture, well, then, then how, do you, how do you keep from doing that? Well, thank you for asking. Here's the next one. If you choose A, then you're drawn to the Word of God. You're going to be drawn to the Word of God. My Bible uses the word delight. So notice that, that this, is a, this is a stark contrast from what he just said, he, he, was, he, he said, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, does not stand in that pathway of sinners, does not sit in the company of mockers. Instead, okay? So it, you, it, you're ha- if you don't do that, instead, you do this. So, so he's making a, a real big contrast here. And, um, and he says, if you do this, then something really different is going to happen. And when you think about the word delight, um, it, it, it's kind of this whole idea uh, here in Scripture. It's, it's about that we get become preoccupied with this, uh, or we're drawn to it, or we really want to enjoy it. We want to, we want to get everything we can out of it. We're, we're, we're sort of inclined to it. We're leaning into it. And that's, that's, that's what God, that's what a life that chooses A it kind of leans in towards towards Scripture. And, and, it, and in this passage, the word delight also carries this idea of purpose in our life. It's one of our main priorities in life, that, that God's Word it dictates who we are, dictates our purposes. It, it's, it's our priority to be in His Word. We want to go to the Word of God. We want to take a deep dive into its meaning, into its truths, what it says to us, what it says about us, how it warns us, how it encourages us, how it rebukes us, keeps us accountable, how it challenges us, and ultimately how it points us to Christ. Psalm 119, 103, I love this verse. It says, how sweet your words taste to me. This is David talking. He says, they are sweeter than honey. And he's doing the best that he can with words that that we would understand and trying to explain how good the Word of God is. And, and he knows that, that, that the Word of God is, is it's vital to his life. And so he, he, he's basically saying, listen, it, maybe it's not honey for you, but think about something that you love to eat. Uh, so th- think about a, a food that you hope is in heaven when we go to heaven, that you hope that it's there. A, a food that you would wait in line for because it's so good. And David, David's got that, that picture in his mind. And he says, your words are, are, are better than that. They're, they're far better than that. And, you know, and so I, I love food, and so this, kinda, this verse really resonates with me. But here's the idea. In order to get the full experience of God's Word, we have to taste it. Now, I am not saying that you should begin to start tearing the pages out of your Bible and consuming those, you know, dipping them in a little ketchup. And, no, don't do that. That's, that's not healthy for you. But what I am saying is that in order to... to 
to have the experience of Scripture is you have to let Scripture, you have to open up Scripture in your life. You have, you have to get into it. You do it, you're going to do it at lunch today. You are. You're going to walk, you're going to go to a restaurant or you're going to go home or something and you're going to get to the table and you're going to sit there and none of you are going to sit there and wait for that food to just float into your mouth. No, you're going to consume it. You're going to take it. You're going to put it in you. You're going to let it satisfy you. Okay? But somehow we think that it's different with God's Word because we think it's next to me. Fill me up. Bring it, Lord. You know, it doesn't work that way. We've got, we've got to open it up. We've got to be willing to consume it. It's not going to taste sweet to us if we don't first taste it. So if, if, you're, if you're not going to walk, stand, or sit in, in culture, then you have to go to God's Word. And if you don't know how to read God's Word, you're not sure where to start, we've got plenty of resources for you. We've got them right out there in our, our welcome desk. They're on our website. We, we would love to, if you're not already in a Bible study here at church, we'd love for you to get involved in one because we talk about God's Word. There's, there's, we have lots of ways for you to, to engage in God's Word. The next thing there is if you choose A, and this, this kind of goes along with what we just said, if you choose A, then you will fill your mind with and act on the Word of God. So you're, you're going to delight, you're going to fill your mind with it and act on the Word of God. And if in verse 2 there in Psalm 1, it says that you delight in the Lord's instruction and you meditate on it day and night. Now, when you hear the word meditate, a lot of you automatically kind of go to, to Eastern culture practices. And, and, and a lot of times meditation, what, what, what you not all of it's this way, but what a, a big goal of meditation is to clear your mind, to empty your mind, to, to, to get everything out. Now, to me, it's a real dangerous thing because when you empty your mind, then what you're doing is you're allowing everything to, to, to kind of come back in, uh, good thing and, and some bad things. It's, and, and I think that really that's what culture wants us to do. Culture says, look, look let, let's empty your, your, your shopping cart. Let's get everything that you just put in there. Let's get it out. And then what, what culture wants to do is it wants to take us shopping and it wants to put everything in that they think is important, everything that they think is right, what they want us to know, what they want us to believe. And so really what, what, what the author of Psalm 1 is, he's, when he says meditate on it, he's not saying empty your mind. He's saying fill your mind up with the Word of God and not just fill it up with the Word of God, but also to act on it. And, and when the psalmist uses that word meditate, it, it really it's, it's, a, it's a comprehensive term for the study and application of the word to one's life. Now, a lot of us are really good at that study part. We're really good at that study part. Like, man, you know, I, I, I read my Bible every day. Or, or I've got like uh, four devotional books that I'm going through and, I, and, and I'm keeping a journal. I, I listen to like 20 pastors online. I'm involved in like eight Bible studies at, at, at different churches and, 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 I, and, and all this stuff. And, and, and you're studying. And, and all that is great. And all that is good. But God's word was meant to come in so then it can go out. And I want to tell you something. If you're not applying God's Word, then you might as well stop studying it and just watch Netflix. Because it'll have the same effect. Some of you go, wait a minute. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that, if you're reading God's Word but you're not applying it, then it's not doing its true work in you. you got to do something with it. you got to obey it. Bible says don't just be hearers of God's word but be doers and it says if you're just hearers then you're what anyone you're fooling yourself you're lying to yourself because it's reading and applying and when the when the author of Psalm 1 says if you choose a uh, to choose to follow God then your life you're gonna you're gonna soak in God's scripture you're gonna be like a sponge but then you're also gonna squeeze the scripture the life, it's going to come out of you. And it's going to apply, you're going to apply it to their life. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living. This is in the Amplified. Uh, Amplified is kind of a commentary on the Bible. For the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, 
energizing, effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and the spirit, the completeness of a person, and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature. You notice that, 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 that this is what the Word of God is trying to do. It's trying to infiltrate all of who we are, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. So it, it becomes, it, we, we soak in the Scripture, we taste the Scripture, we study the Scripture. It comes in so that then it becomes a part of who we are, and when it becomes a part of who we are, then it becomes lived out in the world. So if you're not going to walk, stand, or sit in the culture, then you have to study and apply God's Word. Also there, if you choose A, then your life will be connected to a continuous source of stability, strength, and peace. Stability, strength, and peace. Verse 3 there in Psalm 1, it says that we are like a tree planted by the flowing streams. Now I want you to notice two things about that. The first one is that, that you're like a tree. And when, when I think of tree... I'm not thinking of a little bush or a little flimsy tree that's got to be held up by poles so the wind won't knock it down. I'm, I'm talking about a big tree. We have a great tree here in our campus. It's over here in the, on, on the northeast corner in that little grassy area. Uh, there's, there's a huge tree there. A, a great, it's a great climbing tree. That's the kind of tree I, I, I think about when I read this passage. I think about the tree that was in our backyard growing up in Abilene, 1402 Glendale. You can still go there. There's a monument to me there. You can go by and see it. I'm just kidding. But my, it was a tree house. That my, my dad built us a tree house in this thing. It was two stories. And the first story was in, actually in the tree, and then he connected the, 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 bottom, the bottom story. Uh, it actually had a little balcony. So, I mean, we're talking, this is a pretty fancy tree house. Um, and, and there was a stairway that, that went out, out from outside up to the second floor, and then also underneath, he made a little ladder and cut a little opening in the floor, so kind of like a little trap door, so you could go from bottom to the top to the ladder. And then I don't know why he did this, because we were kids, but, but apparently dad was like, hey, you know, YOLO, you only live once. He actually built a trap door to get on the roof of the, the clubhouse. And so we would go up there and sit up there too. But it was just, but you know, when I think, you, you don't build something like that in a, in a little bitty tree. You build that in a mature tree, in a strong tree that has deep roots. And so God says when, when, we, when we choose to read and apply his word, when we choose to follow him, we are like a tree, but not just any tree. We're like a tree planted beside a flowing stream. Did you catch that? That tree always, always, always has a water source. See, when we choose to follow God, then we are connected to God's never-ending strength for our lives. We're connected to His never-ending love. He loves us always, no matter what. His never-ending peace and stability in our lives. It's, it, it's, it's not that the storms don't, don't come in our lives because we have storms. Some of you are walking in a storm right now, so it's not that the storms go away, but it's, it's just that we're connected to God, and so we can withstand those storms. I heard this earlier this week. It says, life is not perfect, but you allow a perfect God to lead your life and to strengthen your life as you go through those storms. Philippians 4.13, this is a familiar verse to a lot of you. If you grew up in church or grew up reading your Bible, it says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Now, I, I think culture would want to rewrite that verse, and here's how they would rewrite it. And it would say it this way, I can do all things, period. Because that's, that's, that's kind of how culture wants us to think. It's like you don't need you. It's within you. The power is in you. You can do all things. You are strong. You are capable. You, are, you, can, you can do anything. And the truth is, you can through Christ who gives us strength. You know, God is, God is not a, a crutch. God is not a jail cell that keeps us from living life. Um, it, 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 what He is, is we, we're, we follow Him because we know that we have life because He gave us this life. He gave us this life. We can do all things through Him. Why? Because He gives us the strength to do it. Because He is, he is strength. We follow Him because He's the source of strength. We follow Him because He's the source of peace. We follow Him because He's the source of life. He's the creator of all things. And so for me to say, I can do it on my own, that's false because God gave me what I have. I have breath because God gave me breath. I have life because God gave me life. I have the abilities I have because God gave me those. Now I get to choose what I use them with, 
whether I recognize that God, whether I believe that God did that or not, it, it's be, that's, that's beside the point. The truth is, God gave us to us, and so we follow him. Uh, I heard a, a, a pastor say this. He said, uh, you know, we, we should give our lives to Christ, and you know why? Because anyone who can predict his death and resurrection and then pull it off, we want to follow that guy. We want to follow that guy. Anyone who can predict his death and his resurrection and then pull it off, sign me up to be on his team. I want him to be my leader because no one else has done that before, ever. And I'm pretty sure no one will ever do it again. And if you choose A, then your life will produce the fruit of the Spirit. It's, it's, it's a, actually, it's just a natural consequence. If you, choose to, if you choose A, then you're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5, 22, 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit, in other words, the result of His presence within us, is love. That's an unselfish concern for others. Joy. There's an inner peace. There's patience. I love it. It says, not the ability to wait, but how we act while we're waiting. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You're a tree that's connected to the source of life, so you produce fruit. It just naturally happens. It comes out. Of, it becomes, like we said, the Word of God comes in you. It takes residence in you. It dwells in you. It gets down to your bone, to your marrow. It's a part of who you are. It's your ethos. And then it just becomes, it comes out of you. It's supposed to come out of you, so you produce fruit. And I want you to notice the order, though. The fruit doesn't happen unless you're firmly planted in and receiving uh, you're receiving, you're receiving um, nutrients from the giver of life. You see, a, a tree that's not connected is a tree that does not produce fruit. It's a tree that dies. The only thing that produces fruit is a tree that's living and connected to the source of life. Verse 3 says it, it bears its fruit in season. And so in Hebrew, that, that's a, that verb is in the tense of, it's like a continual action. Like it, 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 just, it just happens over and over in your life because you are connected. You are connected there. You, you, you want to know what, what a life looks like that follows God? That's chosen letter A? It's an unselfish life. It's a life with inner peace. It's a life full of patience. It's a life full of kindness. It's a life full of goodness. It's a life full of faithfulness. It's a life full of gentleness. It's a life of self-control. It's a Galatians 5, 22, 23 type life because see when you're connected when you're that strong tree connected to that stream that's what grows in you a friend of mine told me about an activity that he does kind of a spiritual activity where he takes these fruits of the the fruit of the spirit and he takes one and and he prays for it for himself for 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 that day so the fruit of the spirit is love and so this person would pray love for himself every day now and, and the idea is so that that would become a part of, become a stronger part of his life. And, and the funny thing to hear him talk about it is, he, when, you, when you're praying those things, then all of a sudden you start to notice opportunities to practice that. And then you also notice opportunities, or also notice situations where you didn't act in a loving way. And can you imagine what a difference we would make in this world if we practice the fruit of the Spirit? What would, what would, how would your life look different? How would your family look different? How would your job look different? Here's a big one. How would this church look different if as individual people we were connected to, to, the, to the stream of life and the fruit of the Spirit was growing in us? If you choose A, then you'll live in the knowledge that God is always at work even in those dark times. Second Timothy 1.7 says, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Verse 3 there in Psalm 1 says, it says, The leaf does not wither. And then skip down to verse 6. It says, it says, The Lord watches over the way of the righteous. In other words, despite life's conditions... God is with you. God sustains you. God will help you. God will not leave you. God will strengthen you. God is enough. Matter of fact, He is more than enough. That's why Paul says we don't have to have a spirit of fear. We don't need a spirit of fear because we have the spirit of power. Not our power, not my power, but God's power working in in us, in me. 
And we have a, a spirit of, of love, not, not my love, because my love is a selfish love. My love just wants to look after me and what I want, but the love of Christ flowing in us. And we have a spirit of self-control. And how many of you struggle with self-control? I know I do. So it's not my self-control, but it's, it's the discipline of God. It's God's will working its way in us. So all of that, all of that, if, and let me, let me, let me, draw a circle around that word, if you choose A. Now, I said there's two choices, right? There's two choices, so we got to talk about B. If you choose B, then the opposite of everything in choice A will be true for you. You'll think like culture, you'll act like culture, you'll start to belong in culture, you won't be connected to a power source, You'll wonder why life goes the way life goes. The opposite of choose. See, in verses 4 and 5 there in Psalm 1, uh, the author, he, he compares people who choose B, he, he, he compares them to chaff. Now, that chaff, if you know what that is, it, it's quite a contrast between a tree planted by the river and chaff. And, and basically what chaff is, it's, it's kind of a, a seed, co- it covers the seed or it's kind of debris from from, from the grain that, that, that gets uh, taken off when they're, th- when they're going through the threshing process. Actually, I actually watched a, a video on this because, you know, YouTube, you can find anything. But anyway, I was, I was looking at chaff and, and I saw it. And, and there's, ver- there's, you can actually, if the wind, you can take the seed and you can throw the, the seed up in the wind and the wind will actually separate the chaff from the seed. And there's other ways, other ways that, that they do it. But the idea is, is unlike that grain or the seed, the, the chaff, it, it, it has no body, it has no substance, and it's easily blown away. It's just, it's not, it's unstable. And if you look up chaff in the dictionary, one of the ways it describes it is it's, it's worthless. It's of no value. You don't, you don't use it. You don't, you don't need it. You could, it's, it's just, it's not, it's not any good. And, and, and the psalmist tells us that's choice B. In other words, God says if you choose to follow culture, then your life is going to be consumed by things that really don't matter. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to give your whole life to things that are, that are temporary, that don't matter for eternity. And not only will you invest in, 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 in temporary things, but you won't have a solid foundation to build your life upon. Um, you, you're, you're kind of at the mercy of culture. And you know this culture, it's a moving target. It's very fluid. It's changing all the time. Some of you who've been around this earth for, you know, been on this earth for quite a while, you know, maybe in in your 70s or 80s, you know that culture is way different now than what you grew up in. And even those of you who've just been around just for a little bit, you've seen culture change. So imagine trying to build a foundation or to build your identity or build your worth on something that's constantly changing, that they say, well, this is how you're supposed to live life. Well, no, we've changed our mind. This is how you should live your life. No, wait, wait a minute. That's not right either. This is how you should live your life. That's a frustrating way to live. That's, a, that's not a stable way to live. It gets tiring. It gets really old really fast. It's unsatisfying. It can become lonely. And ultimately, ultimately, that type of life separates us from God. And if you choose B, then life, honestly, life won't make sense. It just won't make sense. In verse 6, the writer of the psalm contrasts the two choices. He says, choice, choice A, the Lord is watching over the righteous. Choice B, it leads to ruin. Now, it's not that God is not watching over the unrighteous because He is, but it's the idea that you've chosen B and so you're choosing to pull yourself away from God and a life that's pulled away from God is a life that leads to ruin. Now, you may say, well, Jimmy, I know a lot of people who don't love the Lord who are rich, who are successful, who are doing great, they're happy as can be, they're loving life, they're doing their own thing, and they they don't have anything to do with God. So how can you say that their life's going to lead to ruin? Because that word ruin there, it's not an earthly term, it's an eternal term. Because remember, we weren't made for this earth, we were made for eternity. So it may not look like ruin now, but there'll be a day, there'll come a day when we'll all stand before God. Actually, we'll all kneel before God, whether you believe in Him or not. We're all going to kneel before 
before God, and we're going to have to give an account for our lives. And none of the things that are temporal are going to matter to him. The only thing that's going to matter is the condition of your heart and whether it belongs to him or you've kept it for yourself. You see, your life won't, it, it won't, it won't make sense because you're not using it what it was created to do. You're not using it what it was created for. Your life will be frustrating because it's, it's not being used for its original purposes. And here's the other thing. You'll always ask, is this really all there is? You ever heard someone say that? Is this really all there is? Have you ever said that? Is this really all there is? And the answer to that question is no. There's so much more. There's so much more right here on this earth to live for a bigger purpose, a better purpose. And there's so much more in eternity that you'll get to be a part. And this is not just true of people who don't know the Lord. This is true of believers. Because there are believers, like I said earlier, back to the beginning, who are trying to ride that fence. They're trying to live on that fence. They're trying to to please God, but they're also trying to please themselves. And so they end up just hurting themselves. And really... They're not really pleasing God. They're just, they're just living for themselves. And we have to make a choice. And I said earlier, two choices. You choose to follow God or you choose to follow culture. And honestly, instead of saying culture, I just should have said me. Yeah, you choose to follow me. You choose to follow you or I choose to follow me. You let God lead or, or you can lead. And it's up to you. But each choice, just so you know this, each choice brings very different results brings very different consequences and honestly it's two very different lives so you get to finish the sentence i don't want you to finish i don't want you to say it out loud but i want you to answer it in your heart i choose 